everybody. I'm Betsy Kemeny and I am from Slippery Rock University. I'm an associate professor there. And this is Megan Quayle and she's a, a new alumni of our program. And so what's really neat about not teaching graduate students is that undergraduate, now very competent and smart undergraduate students, get to participate in research. So um, I think that's kind of a cool thing of not having grad students. So, um, and you might be looking at our title and seeing the word canine. And you might be saying to yourself, are you in the right place? Why are you talking about dogs today? Well, um, one of the things that we wanted to talk, uh, what prompted this research I'm a recreational therapist, and as a recreational therapist, one of the things that we're really interested in is best practices and what intervention actually fits the participant the best. So when we're designing treatment, what we want to do is we base it on an assessment and we base it on goals and objectives, and then our treatment plan follows that. So we want to know is what's the best intervention for our patient, client, participant, whatever it's, resident, um, depending on whatever setting we're in. So this um, concept kind of came out of that. And you, basically, so we're exploring, like, is there a change based on the intervention that you're using? And what intervention works the best? So my background, I worked for 20 years in long-term care um, as a recreational therapist before I got a PhD. So I kind of came out of the practice side where I really knew, uh, could see what works and uh, what went, worked well with my patients. So I am a geriatric recreational therapist specialist in that area. And um, so I'm passionate about this area. Later, um, I, you know, earlier on, we did do a study that was funded by the HHRF. It was a more, much more complex study, and we um, did it with uh, youth with autism, and we looked at cortisol levels and heart rate variability, and it was just published in the Journal of Autism and Related Disorders in 2021. But before we actually proposed that study to HHRF, you know what we did? We did three little small faculty student research pilot projects. So I say all that because this is one of those. It's a small, very small um, faculty student research pilot project where we're starting to understand and gather and understand the feasibility of doing this kind of study. So you need to see it in that light. You can't compare it to the first presentation today, <laughs> okay? Um, we're still at, at the, doing the groundwork for this um, one. So I do have to acknowledge some folks that really made this study happen. Um, at Slippery Rock University, we have the Storm Harbor Equestrian Center, which is an 18-stall um, horse barn with two classrooms. And we could have not done the study without the entire staff at Storm Harbor Equestrian Center. So Courtney is the director there, and she um, helped orchestrate everything with me. And we also had other students that worked on the project. Megan was just the one that carried it through, um, through the, the bitter end with me. And uh, we also want to acknowledge um, some of our furry friends as well. Um, Miley and Abby up there. Uh, in terms of some of the background and why I thought this study was important or what the idea came out of, I mean, I think we're all aware of the tremendous burden right now that um, dementia holds because there is no cure for progressive dementia. And we know that by um, 2050, you know, basically, that dementia is pro projected to actually impact um, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, and around the world. So dementia is a very significant area for research, and one of the things that we want to know is, like, what is it that's going to really help in the meantime before there is a cure? Uh, we know that um, the U.S. Census Bureau tells us that about 50% of the long-term care residents 
um, have dementia. So when we look at that long-term care population, we're seeing a high percentage um, with Alzheimer's and related dementias. And <clears throat> along with that, I think it's kind of important to think about, it's not just the fact that the person has dementia, but what are some of the symptoms that go along with it? And a lot of times we, with dementia, we think a lot about um, the whole explosive behaviors, right? Um, you know, some repeated vocalizations or people who leave the building or things like that. But one of the most uh, pervasive behaviors is really apathy and withdrawal with this population. And a lot of times we don't think of that as a behavior, but it is. Um, and so with apathy, withdrawal, lack of engagement in day-to-day, -day, depression, um, all of these things are really key and sometimes get washed under the rug um, when we think about some of these more um, uh, explosive behaviors. So one of the things that kind of comes up with this is that it's not just the behaviors that exist, it's also the fact that the person may or may not be able to actually express how they're feeling and so that compounds the reaction. And I'm going to be referring to distressed reactions because we've moved in, in my field, we've moved away from calling them challenging behaviors or disruptive behaviors to distress reactions. So they're actually reactions to stress and distress that the person's having. And it, 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 that's an imp I think language is important. What we call things is important. And it's the idea that we can sometimes, can't always change everything, but we can change the environment, we can change the care, so that we can help the person be less distressed and kind of seeing it as a reaction to what they're going through versus just they're behaving badly. So I, I just kind of want, I'll use that throughout the presentation. Um, one of the things that we know long term is that a lot of distress reactions, whether it be withdrawal, or um, you know, other types of behaviors actually lead to poor quality of life, leads to problems with their activities of daily living. Um, if you are distressed when you're in the middle of personal care, you're not going to be getting as uh, efficacious personal care. You're, that whole thing is gonna get disrupted. It's not gonna be beneficial. You're not gonna feel relaxed during it. So all of those things kind of contribute. It's, to, and they work together. Um, if you're very withdrawn, you might not get invited to participate in a social activity because people are, you know, the natural tendency would be she doesn't want to. So there's, there's a lot of ramifications for these distress reactions that we don't typically think about. So one of the things that I kind of always start from the, the beginning when I think about these studies, and I like to ask the question, why would we be using a non-pharmacologic approach? And I, I think that all of us right now are using a non-pharmacologic approach. So why would we not use medicine? And in this population, it's pretty clear because, first of all, there, there are some medicines that have some effectiveness, but for the most part, they cause side effects. Most medications do. And if we can find a way with non-pharmacologic approaches to help people with distress reactions, why would we want to give them medication where they might fall? It's going to make their balance change. It might make them more confused might change their ability to um, take themselves to the bathroom. Why would we want to give somebody a medication if there is a non-pharmacologic approach? So I like to start with that and remind us as a group that we are providing a non-pharmacologic approach for people. And we can, and there are some evidence that non-pharmacologic approaches can help with like stress tolerance, engagement, and this, the, problem with withdrawal. So Megan's going to talk more about, okay, so why AAI? And then we'll get into some of the canine and equine work that's already been done. We selected animal-assisted interventions because other researchers have determined that it can, can enhance well-being in older adults in long-term care. 
Research has shown that animal-assisted interventions can improve loneliness, improve quality of life, and decrease neuropsychiatric symptoms when using dogs or cats. Animal-assisted interventions also reduces de depressive symptoms more when compared to non-animal interventions. The mechanism underlying the school-oriented therapy is the human-animal interaction. Older adults get to experience autonomy, exposure to nature, improved attention to surroundings, and a non-judgmental non environment when interacting with the animals. So what we know is that animal-assisted therapy can reduce distress reactions and improve pro-social behaviors, such as improved mood, an increased willingness to participate, and involvement in activities of daily living. When compared to robotic animals, a longer duration of interest was found when interacting with a real dog. To go further into canine-specific research, there have been significant differences in depression levels of people with disabilities when comparing animal-assisted interventions and control groups. Research also indicates that canine-assisted therapy has been shown to decrease agitation and improve, co improve positive communication behaviors such as smile, laughter, and attention span in older adults. Though research, through our research, we determined that animal-assisted interventions is beneficial, but there's still more research needed. Now turning our attention to equine-assisted services and probably more what you're here for, um, research has found that older adults with dementia experienced a reduction in behavioral problems when using guided interventions with horses compared to comparison group. Overall, research found that older adults with dementia engage positively with equine-assisted services. And specifically, equine-assisted learning utilizes reminiscence, grooming, groundwork, and leading the horse. This type of equine-assisted service has been shown to improve life purpose and meaning for older adults with, the, with cognitive impairments. Baldwin has also found that gaze, position, movement, and participation involve, improved when older adults with dementia engaged in equine. Social stimulation, relaxation in outdoor environments, bonding with the horse, and evoking positive memories were some of the perceived benefits participants had when interacting with the horse. So this kind of led us, you know, as we went through this journey of looking at the literature, <coughs> what's been done, what, what works, what doesn't work, we could not find a study that really compared different kinds of animals to typical social interventions. In fact, there's really very little research that even compares um, dogs uh, dog-assisted interventions to anything else except maybe robots. And so one of the things in terms of this gap in research that we started looking at was, well, what would it look like if we compared the effectiveness of canine, equine, and then your traditional rec therapy intervention? So that's what we did. We were looking at what's you know, what is something that we could really look at in terms of the engagement of the individual, their apathy levels, and also kind of looking at this heart rate variability. So what was, what was the methodology that we used? Um, here's, it, it basically was an alternating treatment design, and we did five weeks. And if you know anything about Western Pennsylvania, where Slippery Rock is, um, in, in the fall, we have five or six good weeks, right? <laughs> and then after that, it starts getting cold. And if you know anything about older adults, um, you don't really want them out in too cold a weather. And even though our arena is heated, um, we really didn't think that, that it would work well for it to go into late too late in October. So we gathered our data in the fall when it was still like pleasantly nice out. So we didn't want the weather to impact people's engagement because sometimes I would see in long-term care, if a person was really cold, they're not gonna concentrate on the program that I'm doing. So we didn't want that to be a factor in what we were doing. So we did five sessions. Remember, it's a pilot study. It was a two-hour session, so we alternated the treatment within that two hours, each session being 35 minutes, 
And the one thing that we did, which was a bit sophisticated, was to actually randomize the assignment to what group they were going to be in. And so they got alternating treatments. So for example, if you come week one, you don't always get horse first, right? Um, you don't get to pick which animal you start with. We assigned you to a group, and then we alternated that treatment. You can kind of see it up here. So session one, equine, canine, social. Session two, we mixed it up. It was social, equine, and canine. So basically, the groups um, got a different order of things because we were trying to control for order of treatment. Older adults sometimes get tired, so we didn't want that to be an impact. We, maybe the whole psychological factor of getting off the bus, getting in there and being new to the facility would be an impact that every time they come. So again, we wanted to alternate not only which groups they were in, um, where they were, which facility they were from, but also the order in which they received the treatment. So it was a convenient sample. I actually went out to the facilities and did the informed consent there. I worked with the activity directors in the facility um, and basically we picked um, people that wanted to be part of the study. So they chose. We didn't um, do just anybody came. It were people that wanted to be part of the study. Um, they, again, if you know anything about Western PA, our subjects were all Caucasian. Um, and we had, um, they were age 60 to 92, with the preponderance being on the higher level of the age um, span. They all had a physician determined diagnosis of dementia. Um, one of the things, and I'll talk about future research, but I wish that I had done like a cognitive scale with them to see where they were um, on the, on the um, spectrum of the disease or their cognitive status. But again, this is what you learn when you're doing a pilot study. Um, they all use wheelchairs for ambulation, except for two of them. And we went through the informed consent process. Now, when you're working with older adults in nursing homes, informed consent can be a little bit tricky. You have to make sure that they do understand what they're signing. And so we actually contacted their families as well. Even though these are people who are, had their, they, they didn't have a power of attorney and they could sign for themselves, I wanted the family to know that they were going out of the facility and everything. So and I worked with the activity director extensively on that because informed consent can be tricky sometimes, um, especially with older adults. Okay, so here's the breakdown in terms of the procedure. So basically the researchers were separate from the facilitator. That's a good thing. And then also, um, basically what I, we did was we used people that had equal training. So all of them were rec, uh, certified rec therapists, no students, and they had specialty certification. So that you'll see this, and I'll kind of touch on this later. I think the specialty certification in that area of expertise is really important. So for the canine intervention, we had somebody who was registered with uh, pet partners that had experience, she had years of experience working with canines, but she was also a rec therapist, so she had that background as well. And then for our um, equine, the person had a path cert, because again, that's really important that you know you have a specialty and you're trained in that, um, as well as being a rec therapist. And then for social, we um, just use somebody with a rec therapist <laughs> to create. But there are three different people, and the procedure was the same. So they would start with stroking, grooming, and then um, they did a leading activity with either the horse or the dog, and then they ended with some kind of feeding um, kind of closure where they would give the, the dog or the horse a snack. So basically, we were looking for common, common ways to do a procedure that could be done in both dogs and horses. So that's what we did. The social or control intervention basically started out with a, a fine motor skill type thing, and then we did reminiscence. So that was what, what that was. The uh, canine 
um, and the social were held in, we have two classrooms that are almost identical at Storm Harbor, so they were held in the classrooms, and then of course our equine portion was held either in the barn aisle or in our arena. The measures that we use, we use four. So basically our apathy scale we did before we started the entire intervention and after the entire intervention. So our apathy scale was just measuring, does the whole intervention itself, the five weeks, what is that doing for apathy? First of all, and may, it may be some researchers in here can help me with this, but I couldn't really find an apathy measure <laughs> that looked at something immediately. So most apathy measures kind of look at how has the person been behaving the last seven days, which obviously you can't do in a session, right? It makes no sense. So our apathy measure, we kind of looked at the whole thing. So that wasn't really comparative. And then um, it compared pre to post the whole session. Then we used the EPAS, which is an engagement and preferred activity scale. It was designed by a team of music therapy and rec therapy, and it was designed and validated in this population of people with dementia, and it is being used in nursing homes. So basically it fit the population and had been validated there. And then finally, uh, third, we, used, uh, we looked at targeted behaviors. So uh, Richardson in 2004, she did a canine study and she developed targeted social behaviors. So these were social responsiveness behaviors to the canine. And we just used them also for horses. Of course, we changed dog to horse in every, you know, in the measure and we just called it animal. But basically their social behaviors um, and I can get into every single one of the behaviors, but basically it's an observational measure. So it's an outs, uh, we had a research assistant that was standing there just observing and actually counting how many times these behaviors happened. Um, very, very simple, but um, poignant because in, pre in practice, that's a lot of times what we're doing. We're seeing how often do people respond socially in our treatment session. And then lastly, we did do heart rate variability, and we still have a lot to learn about that because um, it, we use the Bluetooth sensors that clip to the person's ear. We did not think the uh, old-fashioned sensors that had all the cords and things where people would have them um, attached would work very well with this population, so we used the Bluetooth sensors. It's just a little clip. It's about this big and uh, it is attached to an iPad that's far away from the person. I mean, it has to be within the same room, but it doesn't have to be on the person. And um, so that piece of it worked okay, but we'll get into some of the limitations later. And then for analysis, um, be, it was a population of 10. We didn't really have um, good normalcy in our data, so we used Wilcox. And um, basically for engagement, we just looked at more descriptive variables. And we did sort of look at engagement and then some descriptive statistics for this pilot study. And so the results. So when we looked at apathy, um, there are some key um, things with a pretty small effect size. And one of the things I kind of wanted to note, I'll go through the ones that there were um, <coughs> some changes in, in terms of apathy for before and after the entire study. But um, one of the things I think is important to recognize is that some of these items are reverse coded. So when you see the amount go up, um, that is, means that um, it's, it's positive in terms of less apathy. So um, in terms of when we looked at pre to post five weeks, they were significantly at less apathetic in the area of they were more willing to apply effort. So I'm going to say it in the positive way. <laughs> they were um, more willing to be independent in doing things for themselves. They um, said more often or they were reported to say more often that friends were important to them. And finally, they had more intensity in terms of the way they were going about their daily lives. So again, this is a measure that kind of asks in the last seven days, you know, um, and looks at that. Now, we, because we were working with somebody with dementia, we did not ask them to self-report, 
we actually had the caregivers at the nursing home actually do the reporting. So this measure, there is a regular measure that you can give somebody where they just mark it down themselves, and there's also a um, caregiver measure that's a proxy version, and so we use the proxy version. So we actually had somebody else that wasn't related to the study at all um, look at them before and look at them after the five weeks. So basically, it did seem to show some improvement in apathy over time in these areas. And then in terms of engagement scores, um, one of the things about the EPAS, and I'll, I know it's really hard to see from where you're sitting, but one of the things about the EPAS is it doesn't just look at one measure of engagement. The EPAS um, looks at not only, um, <clears throat> It looks at duration of engagement, so how long did, were they engaged. It looks at attentiveness, how attentive were they in their engagement. And then finally, it kind of looks at the attitude. So what was their attitude during the engagement? So it's trying to get at more than what we typically think of, she participated well. It's moving beyond that and kind of looking at what's the duration of the engagement, what's the attentiveness, um, factor, and then what was the attitude during the engagement. So in terms of the EPAS, we found that with the canines, there really wasn't, we looked at 10 minutes at the beginning and 10 minutes at the end, and we compared the two. With the canine, it's kind of a flat line. They just stay the same amount of engaged throughout. With the um, social activity, um, basically, um, they um, basically only it was about session five that we saw some improvement in engagement, but none of the other sessions so showed any significant improvement. And then with the equine, basically what you see is less engagement at the beginning and more engagement at the end. So that's kind of the big picture of what was going on with the equine sessions. So we at session two, session three, and session four, we saw different things, but there was significant improvement in duration with session two. There was significant improvement with attentiveness and attitude in session three, and a significant improvement in duration um, and attitude in session four. So basically what you're seeing is less engagement to more engagement, which I think I kind of have been, have been hearing some that resonates with some other literature out there where it talks about, you know, it might take a little while to warm up, but then you're fully present, fully engaged by the end of the session. So what are the big picture uh, things here? First of all, overall we saw really high levels of engagement for every single one of the interventions. It was really hard to tease out many differences because they responded really well and were highly engaged to all of, the, all of the interventions. So therein is an interesting conundrum. Um, secondly, when we kind of added the total scores together to try to get a bigger picture of everything going on, Basically, the total equine showed the most improvement over time. So if I, when I added up all of the sessions, all the measures, the equine showed the most improvement from that engagement. And then um, the social and control sessions, they kind of started high and stayed high. So that's kind of interesting variation. And then in terms of the target behaviors, um, I graphed this out, but again, I'm not sure people can, in the back can see it. But basically, when we did the targeted behavior, such as looking at the animal, touching the animal, talking to the animal, um, those particularly targeted behaviors, canine overall was much higher. Sorry, I wish I could report something different, <laughs> but it, it, the data is what it is. And then um, when we looked at what was interesting, and fascinating in the results to me is that the equine had a slightly higher frequency of um, when you looked at behaviors that were physically involved. And so Megan's going to tell you what we think about that. So if it was just self-initiated, smiles, laugh, touching, canine actually came out ahead. Equine was 
ahead and higher frequency with like gross motor movements, physical involvement. Okay. And then finally, the heart rate variability didn't really show very much. Um, in terms of, you know, we, look, we didn't look at all the different measures that we could have, but basically you're seeing a lot of the same if you look at average values between the three. So, um, you know, I'm not, we're not quite sure what that means. We need to tease out the heart rate variability piece a little bit more. All right. On to discussion. Um, starting with apathy. Based on our research, we found that a consistent three-pronged program decreased some apathy scores in participants. The change in apathy suggests a cumulative effect on apathy from engaging in two hours of recreational therapy per week for five weeks at the equestrian center. Um, since apathy was measured using the observations of the last seven days versus each session, um, no conclusions can be drawn on the comparative effectiveness of each session. But it does show that there could be a potential benefit for residents with dementia to be transported to an equestrian center for this type of program. And then with our comparative engagement, we saw extremely high percentages of engagement for all interventions, as said, throughout the five weeks. Um, the percentage of engagement re remained stable throughout RT using K9 and the social interventions. And while the engagement improved significantly, significantly throughout RT using equines. Dr. Kimeny found a similar response to the current study in cortisol levels with youth with autism on the, without the autism spectrum. The therapeutic horseback riding started with higher cortisol levels and then dropped more dr drastically, similar to how our engagement with equine in this study improved more than canine. While the stress management started with lower cortisol levels and remained kind of stable throughout, which is how our canine interventions and social was stable and high engagement. And then with our targeted animal be assisted um, social behaviors, there's a much higher frequency of targeted social behaviors with RT using canines <laughs> rather than using equines. Um, and then again, there is a higher frequency of the physical movements, which um, we think potentially is because of you have a larger animal. You're doing more gross motor movements, whereas with a dog, things are more similar, they're more at eye level, and you're not doing as much as more natural, um, which this could be helpful. If equine brings up more of this physical engagement, it's important to base programs around that. Um, and then with heart rate variability, the coherence levels coincide with the interpretation that participants were slightly more relaxed or in a coherent state with dogs and social than with equine. However, the differences were not statistically or clinically significant to make any major conclusions. So again, why is there a difference? Um, client preference and life history of pets or farm life is one reason why there may be a difference. A finding consistent with other research suggested that animal-assisted interventions in general evokes positive memories of a pet and that a favorite pet may more deeply be stored in a person's long-term memory due to the emotional connections you have. Individuals are also more likely to have dogs as pets compared to horses, and the size may also affect the comfort level of individuals if not familiar. Again, talking about the size of the animal, um, a person using a wheelchair, a dog is more at eye level, um, which may lead to more eye contact with the animal, touching the animal, and speaking to the animal. The higher frequency of physical engagement with the horse may relate, again, to the gross motor movements and focused attention you need when grooming, leading, and feeding the horse. The data suggests that reminiscing about dogs was at a higher frequency than horses, and it was noted that reminiscing about dogs typically, again, refer to your favorite pet, while reminiscing about horses related to early farm experiences. As one person said, that's a nice quarter horse like I had, or other farm references. Just some limitations and future research. Our small number of participants did create a problem with the statistical power. It was also hard to um, isolate the impact of each intervention, 
specifically again with apathy. Um, in future research, collecting autobiographical information prior to the study about clients' preference of animal and situations like that, what they've been used to, is needed. And um, while the EPAS is a reliable and valid instrument for this population, a more sensitive instrument for measuring engagement may be beneficial in future studies, something that differentiates closer engagement. Like we said, we had high participation in all of them, so something that can really point that out. We may need to develop it, though. Yeah. <laughs> and then on to application. Structured animal-assisted therapy sessions facilitated by CTRS may decrease some symptoms of apathy related to socialization and improve stress tolerance or your coherence and engagement. RT with equine showed more significant improvements in engagement, while RT with canine more consistently yielded engagement, coherence, and frequency of targeted social response. Again, a specific life review assessment for the needs for engagement and the lifelong preferences with animals is important when choosing which animal you're using and to make sure that the session is individualized for the person to meet their needs. Talking a little bit more about that, um, goodness of fit, assessing both your animal and person is important when um, creating a program. And you do that by looking at the physical and sensory function of both the person and the animal, your social functioning, adaptability, and the psychological functioning of each uh, human or animal. And training, um, like Dr. Kimney said earlier, it's important for us to have additional training in animal-assisted interventions and animal behavior when planning programs, unless you're going to partner with an expert. So that is our contact information. What questions do you all have? I'm curious, what was your hypothesis going into the study of why? Our hypothesis was that um, equine, because equine was a more novel experience for people, we, ex we kind of did expect to see more initial engagement with the canine. And the fact that it, many of them we know had dogs as pets. So, in some ways, there was an expectation of that, but um, honestly, um, I would have expected the rec therapy intervention itself to be more, I mean, it was a control, but I, I didn't really expect it to be as efficacious as working with the animal because uh, we, you know, as a rec therapist working in long-term care, when you bring in animals, you see a complete change in people's engagement. I mean, I, I can't talk about it without thinking about a woman that I worked with. This is eons ago, I'm kind of old now, but myself, but basically she would do repeated ver verbalizations and call out her husband's name constantly for basically 24 hours, seven. And when I went and brought in puppies from the SPCA, this was, you know, years ago, and she started stroking the puppy and talking to the puppy. And so, I mean, I think that early on, most people that work um, with older adults, you see that responsiveness. So I kind of did expect more responsiveness from the animals. But I don't know what effect, here's the thing, we can't really separate out the effect of getting out of the facility and going to the Storm Harbor brings, because I and mean, this was before COVID. We were very, very fortunate because we gathered all our data before COVID. But I mean, it happened in the fall of 2019. But um, I, I'm sure most of you know that a lot of nursing homes are still shut down and not able to go anywhere. Um, and I can't even send students to a lot of nursing homes yet. So um, I think that the need for research in this area is only going to escalate because you're seeing even more ramifications from social isolation. Um, 
what what would your what would a traditional rec therapy um, session look like if you if it wasn't a part of this study? Because I did you made adjustments to kind of make more similarities in the conditions so that you were just isolating the effects of the of the dog versus the horse versus the but it, it seems like that's probably not what you would traditionally I mean, do. Actually, recreational therapists, we use a lot of different modalities. That's kind of our MO. We write, we try to understand where the participant patient resident is coming from in terms of their unique life history and gear it to that, so their leisure interests. So we might use a, a variety of things, but one that's very typically used, and I'm not saying bingo, because I'm not a bingo person, but um, one of the things that's typically used is the reminiscence. <coughs> so I, that is kind of a decent control because it's a social group, it gets people thinking, and one of the things you definitely saw spontaneously was a lot of this, oh, that's my dog, Pluto, and it, what, that's not the, it was Miley, but they're uh, associating with their dog and calling you know, Miley Pluto. I hear engagement here with people with dementia. I hear engagement to some degree with people with autism. I hear it from the OTs and PTs I work with with children. Does that become something that just for all of the research for some of the populations that is an important measure? I think it's extremely important because, well, first of all, in our field, and obviously I'm a professor of rec therapy, so a student is never going to be able to write a goal or objective that uses the word participate ever. <laughs> but, and it's always about how, what type of engagement and that kind of thing. So we do need to measure it better because it, it's like one of these latent variables you have to figure out how how are you going to actually piece it out? And that's what I like about the EPAS is it starts to get at that. How long did they engage? How attentive were they? What was their attitude? Because if you have a crummy attitude and you're frowning and you look very anxious and you're still engaged, is, is that good engagement? Uh, you know, or is it only like do we want that positive attitude while people are engaged? That's kind of what we're looking for. We're not looking for somebody that's really upset and engaging. Yeah. I'm curious, um, since it was kind of like someone observing and taking notes on their engagement, if maybe um, some of that discrepancy between the equine and the canines was because we as a society understand what engagement with a dog looks like as opposed to with a horse. And maybe like the information that they were receiving where, for example, I have kids with autism who get on a horse and like mellow out and just like chill out. And then I have others who get on a horse and like won't stop talking. <laughs> so um, like the, I guess, uh, relationship effect, mm -hmm. so to speak, looks, a, it is, is a little different, I, I'd say, in terms of like observing. I'm mm -hmm. curious, I guess, kids, I was curious about that, like societal. Like, no, I think you have a really good point. And that we developed our targeted social behaviors, is what you're talking about, from a research study where she had actually validated them. So we were trying to do that and take uh, targeted social behaviors that she had used with a canine and applied to equine. So I think you're right. That very well could be a problem. But then how do you com do comparative effectiveness if you're not looking at the same thing? So I think you're right. You can't say one is bad and one is good or it's more important to talk. But I mean, one thing that was kind of interesting that I didn't bring out was that the participants actually talked to the handlers the same amount as equal, which I thought was really interesting, which that's good because you wouldn't want one handler to be more 
uh, inter interactive than the other. So they, they basically were the same in their interaction with the handler. And they were two different handlers because they had two different specialties. But you're, you're bringing up a good point. I think that has to do with how we scale those targeted behaviors. And that would need to be looked at for future research. Yes? Were all the horses full-size horses, or did you have any miniature horses? No miniatures. When you were talking that's about a really good idea, too. Yeah. That's what that means. No, these are, you're, they're our horse. We have a mixture of different horses, but they're all full-size. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. You are welcome. Yeah.